Hello there. My name is Tristan Cheeseman, and this is The End War. Episode 1, The End of the World. On March 4th, 1801, Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, slaver, anarcho-libertarian, and philosopher, became President of the United States of America. He had narrowly defeated Aaron Burr when the House of Representatives voted in favor of Jefferson after a tie in the electoral votes occurred. Aaron Burr became his vice president, and Jefferson became the leader of a nation on the precipice of cataclysmic change. The United States, when Jefferson became president, was a nation of slavery, of genocide, of freedom, and of contradiction. It was a nation where women had little to no rights, where blacks were slaves, and where Native Americans were a roadblock, a soon-to-be casualty that would be rolled over in no time flat. It was a nation that stayed out of international conflicts, preferring to play in the sandbox it won from the British Empire in 1783. It was a nation that was built on freedom, but didn't even have a truly free system of election, and if you don't know what the Electoral College was, uh, let me tell you, it wasn't free, operating off of that Electoral College. Senators were chosen by state legislatures, and in many states, only property-owning males could vote, though that was changing. This was the nation that Thomas Jefferson, who himself owned hundreds of slaves, of course, on his plantation at Monticello, became the leader of. By his death on July 4th, 1826, of course again, that nation he helped build was unrecognizable. Decisions by people far from and inside the United States had caused magic to be released upon the world, and all the old myths were suddenly made real. The first homo fabulous were entering adulthood, thousands of coyote people, fox people, and even those more rare ones like gorgons, minotaurs, and vampires serving openly in the United States armed forces. The U.S. had freed the slaves. Uh, it's kind of hard, after all, to keep a bunch of people in chains when they could shoot fire out of their fingertips. So, you know. Women had the same rights as men, the progress of America being made only at first to just spite France, but now having become ingrained in only two decades into the American ideal. And, of course, the United States was engaged in an epic, titanic struggle with France, allied with the people of the Western Hemisphere and the free peoples of Europe, Africa, and Asia, to defeat the now massive and conquest-bound French Empire, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, who was hell-bent on extending his reach from horizon to horizon, from the setting sun to the rising sun, not knowing he was to die at the hands of his own progeny. The banks had all closed down, Property was collective, free speech was limited, and Americans were devoted to making sure that freedom, however they viewed it, would be preserved across the world in an epic fight against the most evil empire to ever exist. This is the world that Thomas Jefferson left. The world of the end war. His final words were, If I could take back that $60 million, I would do it in a heartbeat. I could barely recognize anything anymore. Take me, so that I might find peace somewhere beyond. The End War was and is the most disastrous and famous conflict in the history of humanity, as I'm guessing everybody on this podcast has heard of. Beginning in 1814, the war would pit the Imperium, the faction led by Imperial France and containing her client and allied states, that is, nations subjugated by the French, against the Western Coalition, led by no one, and instead of vast collective of nations who all allied over their shared desire to make sure that France was defeated and that freedom was restored to themselves, their neighbors, and even the world. It lasted 20 years, from its opening shots on the plains of Kiowa in the United States to the final siege at Paris itself. It involved every great power, every secondary power, and was fought on every continent, including Antarctica. By the end of the war, 120 million people were dead, a huge chunk of those people being regular citizens. To put that in perspective, that was 12% of the entire world's population in 1800. The last time reliable census data exists before the start of the end war, which, as one can expect, put an end to most data taking, and it decimated human civilization. I mean, we're talking about a war with 120 million dead that was only fought with muskets, magic, and swords. There were no modern weapons in this war. It destroyed human civilization, the world's ecosystem, it left everything in ruin. It was disastrous as everybody, I'm sure, knows. But to cover the war in all its theaters, in its entirety, would take 200 episodes. It was fought, as said, everywhere. Skirmishes in Peru, espionage in Poland, mass battles in China. 
Mages on every continent, mythical creatures in many of the battles, each place having its own personal history of the war, all the way down to the very smallest towns. Each one of those towns, each one of those people, defining whether or not history would be a bleak march into the grave of order, or a brilliant, chaotic light of freedom. To cover everywhere is not possible. Unless those who enjoy this podcast would want to see that one day. Hint, hint. No. Instead, this series will be covering where I'm from. The United States was one of the major players, if not the other gigantic player, and that should tell you what the group of nations fighting France was actually like. The United States was not a superpower. Before anything, before Winter's Wind and Magic, before the world was plunged into the nightmare of war, the United States was a nation of freedom that promised freedom to a select few people, as said. That is, straight white men with property, or about 6% of the U.S. population. Women had no civic rights to speak of, and were expected to manage the household and raise good American boys who would go on to join the civil bureaucracy. Native Americans were, well, a roadblock. They would be destroyed on the epic conquest of an entire continent. And of course, the United States had 893,000 black slaves who worked the plantations and towns in the southern states and had no voting rights, no matter the gender, no matter where they lived. They were property, and they were treated as such. Bargained and sold like cattle for the slaughter. How free. The United States was a nation of freedom. You could even call it the freest in the world. And it only gave freedom to those lucky few birds. Oh, and by the way, I would not call it the freest in the world at the time, but that's a little hard to judge. It was a Christian nation. Heterosexuality was not just the norm, it was the only choice. Homosexuality was illegal in many places, and in New England, it was treated with the zeal of a Puritan. That is, that one crazy guy you know, who keeps going to church and screaming about gay people. That's what everybody in New England was like. If you were gay, you were a pariah. And that was that. By the end of the war, the United States had freed the slaves, made women equal to men, and legalized LGDA rights. And for any of my European listeners, where LGDA rights are still illegal in many places, that stands for lesbian, gay, deosexual, and altered gender. The United States had thrown on its had thrown out its first constitution, excuse me, made mages equal in the eyes of the law, and even protected non-human species, though not much. They were only protected in that they got to live. Other than that, it was a free-for-all. It was a nation that had curtailed freedom of speech and press, given huge power to the executive, and become truly imperialist. I only say all this because it's hard for us modern Americans to understand how massive of a change this would have been in only a few decades. But tell the story of the end war, or as many Americans know it, the American Crusade, we must begin with the story that came before the end war. And to tell that story, we have to begin with Europe, with the man who would one day become the personification of tyranny itself. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on August 15, 1769, on the Italian island of Corsica. Born to low-level nobles, he became a supporter of Corsican independence when he left for France to get an education in the military. After spending some time in France, he became an ardent Frenchman, and abandoned his Corsican roots. During his time in France, he would come to see himself as a revolutionary. To that end, skipping a lot of his life because we have a lot of cover, ground to cover to get to at least 1810, Napoleon became a general after being cleared of anti-revolutionary charges, and he was sent into Italy. He was a master of artillery, and to make another incredibly long story short, he decimated the Austrians in northern Italy, and began driving straight for Vienna, before signing a separate peace with the, with the entire empire of Austria. His peace was signed, and then sent to the Directory, which was the current ruling body of France. France itself had gone through four governments by that point since 1789, when the National Assembly was created in response to anger with the king, Louis XVI. They had bore the reign of terror, the revolutionary wars, internal revolts, and external pressures. The nation was in near constant chaos since the king found his head lopped off in January of 1793. The people of France, though filled with zeal for their country, were fast losing their zeal for this so-called revolution which had really seen a variety of different governments, all authoritarian and most of them terrible in several ways, take control of the country. The wars also left hundreds of thousands of people's lives cut short, and Paris was threatened on more occasions than were liked by the people. And that would be more than zero. The nation had tossed away Catholicism, monarchy, measurements, and time itself as it sought a new, revolutionary ideal that would make it an enlightened country. By the time of the Directory, as said, France was more or less asking for someone to just come in and make everything go back to normal, as long as there was no king on the throne, and as long as you kept the Declaration of Rights of Man, 
And as long as, okay, well, maybe they didn't want to go back to normal, but they just wanted things to be okay. Well, they found a hero to at least root for near the end of the revolution in Napoleon. His victory over the Austrians had knocked an entire enemy empire off of France, and his early stunt, firing grape shot into a bunch of royalists in Paris, had earned him some credit among the higher-level revolutionaries. It was here that he began to imagine if perhaps it was his destiny to sit on the throne. Throne? Oh, sorry, not throne. I mean, the elected revolutionary seat of France. Yes, we can go with that for now. Napoleon, however, decided to chase his dreams of being Julius Caesar, and this is where he goes from General Bonaparte to Napoleon. In 1798, Napoleon began, began his Quixotic campaign for the land of Cleopatra, with 54,000 men and 400 ships. He marched into Cairo, and most importantly, he brought what would come to be known as the Napoleonic Brigade. This was a team of scientists, if you can call them that, scholars and learned men who were brought to study ancient Egyptian culture, making damn well sure they just ignored the current Egyptians there, who were none too happy to find a massive French army pilfering around their sacred monuments to the past. They may be Muslim, but they were certainly still Egyptian. Well, whatever the case with rampant colonialism, this is the turning point in Napoleon's life. He would, after consulting with a few friends, elect to stay the night in the Great Pyramid, the old tomb of Pharaoh Khufu, the greatest of all the rulers of Egypt's old kingdom, and surrounded in, let's say, a little bit superstition. If Napoleon had decided against this stay, who can say what the world would be like today? It would probably have magic eventually, but Napoleon's determination is what truly sent the world spiraling into chaos. Because Napoleon came out the next day pale and shaken. He had seen a vision, and he would tell no soldier of that vision, eventually decreeing the expedition a failure to himself and then just abandoning all of them after, well, they got screwed over by the British Navy. Most of the, most of the soldiers later said this was a blessing in disguise. Napoleon arrived home and told only his new wife, Josephine, about the harrowing experience he had in the depths of the old pyramid. There, he was led to an undiscovered room where he was confronted by the ghost of Khufu himself. In all the pharaoh's splendor and glory, he bestowed a metal rod, blueprints, and a vision upon the future emperor of France. He told Napoleon that one day he would unleash magic and myth back upon the world and to use it to conquer all of existence, planting a French flag on every continent and making all the world subject to him. His wife reportedly was so flabbergasted that she thought about leaving him, but chose to stay by his side. A wise choice, as one year later, he executed a successful coup against the Directory, which saw the overthrow of the final revolutionary government of France and the raising of Napoleon to the leadership of his country. He became first consul in 1799, and he would then finish the wars against the second coalition of European nations who were hell-bent on destroying this revolutionary, chaotic nation. And can you blame them? Monarchs do not like seeing other monarchs get killed by all their peasants. Now, this quick recap of Napoleon's life doesn't do his life justice, if we can call him a just man. But it is here, as he takes control of France as first consul, that we can finally arrive back to the United States. The United States, as a concept, was originally a tax revolt that began in the late 1760s and early 1770s, with the American colonists becoming angry that the United Kingdom had, after centuries of what was called benign neglect, suddenly tightened the grip on their colonies, demanding their fair share of taxes to the empire. However, the colonists saw it as unfair, as they provided a great many resources, and besides the point, paying taxes was not something they just wanted to start doing, they'd gotten along fine not paying a lot of taxes at all to the British. More importantly, or at least important philosophical-wise, the colonists wanted an equal seat in Parliament, not just some random representative of all 13 colonies. After all, the needs of a New Yorker were far, far different than the needs of a Virginian, and they probably didn't like each other that much. What also ruffled the feathers of the colonists was the Proclamation Line, created after the Seven Years' War, which we can call World War 0.5 if you like, to keep peace with the Native Americans and avoid another cross-ocean war that might truly and finally bankrupt the British. And the British were not interested in helping a bunch of crank colonists start another intercontinental war just so that they could all live in Ohio. The colonists saw it differently, that they had fought hard so that Britain could gain the land east of the Mississippi, which was originally owned by France, the great enemy of the British, and soon their greatest nightmare. Over the course of the 1770s, the colonists continued to be obstinate, and the British bungled any response they had to them. Finally, in 1773, 
after a group calling themselves the Sons of Liberty threw four million dollars of tea, and that is a lot of money, into the Boston Harbor, Britain stopped playing with the carrot and brought in the stick. They dissolved the Massachusetts government and locked down Boston Harbor. But after trying the carrot, they randomly beat everybody they could find with the stick, including those who were loyal to the cover to the British Empire, excuse me. And the colonists had enough. Soon, meetings were made across the country, culminating in the first Continental Congress met in, meeting in 1774. This meeting was not originally to begin the momentous discussions of American independence, but as the delegates arrived, it became clear that the two camps, those who were loyal and those who wanted to split away from the tyrannical king, were the main conflict of the Congress. And by 1776, the independence faction had easily won out after the British just kept screwing up the response. And on July 4th, 1776, the United States declared independence from Great Britain. To make this war short, the UK captured many urban centers, but were unable to hold the countryside. And with France and Spain entering the war on the side of the Americans to help kick Britain a bit, the UK finally quit the war, and the US gained independence. Along with all lands east of the Mississippi that Britain had stolen away from France, minus Canada, the US had finally gained its independence stemming from a bunch of angry libertarian philosophers not wanting to pay their taxes. However, the early U.S. was chaotic, which would mirror the Second Republic and its eventual transition into the Third Republic. The U.S. originally existed under the Articles of Confederation, Confederation, which created a weak, possibly planned to fail federal government. However, after Shays' Rebellion led by Daniel Shays, oh, don't forget that name, by the way, the Constitutional Convention was called. The Constitution, the second document to function as the governing document of the United States, established the executive, legislative, and judicial sections of the U.S. government that would still be the base of the eventual Articles of Government. Ratified in 1789, the first president wasn't in much doubt by anyone. George Washington, the famous patriot and the super-Republican who arguably made the entire revolution possible thanks to his singular devotion to the ideals of freedom, became the first president in 1789 and served two terms. During his time as president, he established the leader of the United States was a citizen, not some higher authority, equal to his brethren, which was, let's just say, a little strange at the time. The leader equal to his people? I mean, you've got to be insane. He developed the Second Republic's pension for neutrality, and he tried to make political parties a socially awkward topic, we'll say, though that was a pipe dream of his that even Washington probably knew was impossible to achieve. However, he gave respect to the position he held, and was mindful of each and every move he made as the first executive of his nation. However, he also oversaw the beginning of the U.S. genocide of the Native Americans, and his idealistic view of politics allowed political parties that would one day tear the nation apart to develop under his nose. Not to mention, he did nothing to curb the spread and expanse of slavery. He was a slaver, after all. It is here that the convergence of Napoleon in America first occurs, though not when Napoleon is in power. Under Washington, the, ne the Neutrality Declaration was issued, which said that the United States would be neutral in all upcoming conflicts between France and Britain. It was a correct move, but a divisive one. Modern Americans who first study this period often find it strange to think that people of this time were in love with the French, the nation that would not too far in the future try to subjugate the world under the iron fist of tyranny. But at this time, France was a sister revolution, throwing off the yoke of a monarchy and raising the tricolor flag over a republic, if a dysfunctional one. As France descended further into chaos and war, the United States made its first peaceful transition of power between two presidents. Washington retired after his second term, dying shortly after it in 1799. His successor, John Adams, is not important in the origin story of the end or. He also wasn't a great president. But the man who lost that election... The man who would eventually become president in 1800 is. Thomas Jefferson is the other part of the equation that would eventually help unleash magic into the world. Jefferson was born in Virginia in 1743 to a rich plantation family in Shadwell, outside of Charleston, Virginia. Insatiably curious since youth, Jefferson became a lawyer and in 1769 he was elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses. That's Virginia's old state legislature. There, he spoke out against the king and his tax policies, which landed him in the small clique of radicals who would form the base of the American Revolution. He was given the honor of being the main author of the Declaration of Independence, which would cement his place as an American legend. 
During the revolution, he served in France, helping secure funds and an alliance with the cautious but eventually helpful French, who expected paybacks and help in future wars. Uh, sorry about that. He stayed in France for several years, returning after the signing of the Constitution, and being surprised to find himself the new Secretary of State to George Washington. Now, Jefferson didn't much care for the first president, and he hated the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. We'll come back into our story when the Troubles begin in the United States. To sum it up, Jefferson was a Democratic Republican by day and by night. He was an anarcho-libertarian who might have hated the concept of government itself. He supported the Confederation First Republic over the Constitutional Second Republic, and when he was in office anywhere, he aimed to lessen the presence of that government and to curb the power of banks and other things he saw as both unconstitutional and not dem democratic. His opponent, Hamilton, was a Federalist. He was THE Federalist, who helped invent the Second Republic's economic system and saw Jefferson as a fake country bumpkin, which, mm, not, a t not an exactly wrong thing to say. It was Washington's support of Federalism and Hamilton that would lead to the famously thin-skinned Jefferson hating the both of them, finding his ally in the younger James Madison, a close friend of his. Once again, remember that name, James Madison. He is important when the end of war finally begins, and when Anna Komenai manages to find the Cleveland gun, he will be the president for both of those. Oh, also he'll create the United States Mage Corps. So Madison is important. Madison's story starts with Jefferson, though. Jefferson, by this point, was no longer Secretary of State. He had quit, and he was planning a presidential run against Adams. He was attacked vigorously over his Francophile nature. Jefferson loved France, he loved the French, and he nearly worshipped the French Revolution. Even as the French started to lop off everybody's head, Jefferson was privately praising the Revolution, seeing it as a necessary step to the eventual World Revolution that most modern historians agree he must have believed in. That said, it should be noted that slaver, possible rapist, and certain misogynist Thomas Jefferson was not a communalist, and he never would support major non-human rights after 1804 when his presidency ends, so... Yes, you're one weird friend who keeps saying that Thomas Jefferson was a communalist and, like, believed in collective property. Yeah, you can tell him he's wrong. And finally, we arrive at the final crossroad. In 1800, as Napoleon cemented his new status and began his plan to become ruler of the entire continent of Europe, Thomas Jefferson defeated Aaron Burr, another important name, sorry, there's a lot of them, in the presidential election. It was decided in the House of Representatives, when a surprise endorsement from Alexander Hamilton, yes, the one I just said hated his guts, I know, very weird time, helped tip the balance of the votes, along with the fact that Congress just preferred the man who wrote the declaration, as opposed to an opportunistic political grifter, and you gotta go with them on that one. Firstly, Jefferson changed how the vice presidency worked. Amending the Constitution, it was made that instead of the VP just going to the guy who came in second place, which, that's so stupid, not sure who came up with that one, a candidate would have to choose his vice president, who would usually be, you know, elected alongside him, which is going to get real important really quick. Before that, though, Jefferson appointed as his minister to France, Robert Livingston, who played a central role in the coming purchase of Louisiana. Back in France... Thomas Paine, the famous essayist of the American Revolution, he wrote Common Sense, and soon to be screaming anti-Christian, he died penniless and nobody liked him, had managed to get a meeting with Napoleon. Napoleon loved Paine. Apparently, he kept some of his essays under his pillow, and he saw him as brilliant. They were discussing ways to invade England. Oh, by the way, Paine is from England. Napoleon offered him a place then in his soon-to-be great project, as he called it. Payne listened, and he was horrified when he was told that the greatest minds of the Western world would be coming to help him unlock the true nature of the heavens and cosmos, which made Payne just a little nervous. He ended this meeting, and he caught a boat back to the United States, where Payne would eventually meet with Jefferson, an old friend, and he wouldn't go back to France, even though he was elected to the National Assembly ever again. He would tell Jefferson of Napoleon's plans, which, they sounded sinister and crazy, but Jefferson shrugged it off. He and Payne had bo both had at least a decent liking of the soon-to-be emperor, and they assumed that Napoleon had no plans that would hurt the United States. I mean, that would be quite an insane war to take up. After all, Jefferson managed to end the Quasi-War, which saw France and America fighting each other's navies in the Caribbean. Not a declared war, by the way. They just were trying to beat the shit out of each other, I guess. 
Riding off that high, Jefferson immediately screwed himself over. While Napoleon celebrated the birth of a healthy baby girl in 1801, who he named Hippolyta, after the Greek heroine, so yeah, take that in, Jefferson passed the Embargo Act of 1802. The act was aimed at the warring nations of the world, which Jefferson thought was just so rude, so he banned all foreign trade. He was also trying to destroy the Hamiltonian system, but instead, he just destroyed the entire American economy. By the end of the year, the U.S. was in dire financial straits and was on the verge of economic ruin. Oh, and those warring nations didn't care. It was Britain and France. It's not like they cared what a bunch of country bumpkin libertarians thought. The government may have had money, but the people did not. At the same time, by 1803, Napoleon had run into a little crinkle in his plan. You see, he had sent a massive fleet and expedition to recapture Saint-Domingue, a now free colony of former slaves who had revolted from the French and thrown off their yoke. It uh, would become Haiti, usually by killing any powerful white or colored person they could find on the island. However, Napoleon was pushed back, and the expedition was a failure, destroying Napoleon's spirit. He was going to use the money from the lucrative colony, it made sugar, to fund the last part of his great project on the small island of Elba, which he hoped would finally allow him to harness some secret weapon he was planning to defeat his foes. By this point, everyone knows what I'm talking about, but let's keep up the drama. It's what makes history interesting, after all. The dramatic irony of it all. Napoleon was sure that he had failed. But then, his snaky foreign minister Talleyrand, the famed weasel of diplomacy and politics, gave an interesting idea. So, Napoleon mailed Jefferson and offered him a deal he couldn't refuse. Send a few men to talk with me, and I'll sell you all the Louisiana territory. Starting price, $120 million. Oh, by the way, Louisiana, that's a massive chunk of land. There'll be a map up. You can go check it out on Twitter. The number was absurd for a nation that had decided to try and live without trade, but Jefferson couldn't pass it up. Despite protests from some of his own party, Jefferson sent three men to deal with Napoleon. Thomas Paine, James Madison, and their leader, Robert Livingston. Robert Livingston is the important person in this equation. He is a devoted Democratic Republican. He was also a fan of the French. However, Paine was concerned that Napoleon, who had recently made his, you know, insane proposition, had ulterior motives to selling Louisiana. He was right, by the way. While it would be hard to manage a colonial empire without Haiti, it wouldn't be impossible. But that was a reason given by a few French diplomats when Payne asked why Napoleon was so eager to sell the entire thing. Napoleon, Napoleon, not Napoleon, for his part, went along with the ruse. He lied to the three men, saying that the needed money for his eventual defense of the free world from those damnable British across the channel. Livingston, being the leader and a better diplomat than the other two, managed to bargain the $120 million down to $60 million by the May of 1803. And finally, on April 30th, 1803, the men signed the Louisiana Purchase, and Livingston went to tell Napoleon personally, who was waiting in another room. Payne, who was still skeptical, saw the purchase as necessary nonetheless, though he questioned the constitutionality of the entire venture. Madison and Livingston were both ecstatic, and Napoleon was in rapture when the news came. He, though this is probably apocryphal, stole the document from Livingston's hands and thrust it into the air, shouting, I've done it! I've conquered Europe! Livingston, uh, concerned, asked him what he meant. Napoleon, in euphoria, spilled the beans to Livingston. The whole plan. His plan was to capture a sorcerer, Stick a lightning rod he found in the Great Pyramid on his head, have the man climb to the top of the now being constructed with all of this new money, beacon to the heavens, and then the Napoleonic Brigade would say some incantations that Napoleon learned in the Pyramid from the Vision, apparently, and it would release magic into the world, which Napoleon would use to conquer his foes and raise the French flag across Europe, starting with the UK. Livingston, in his diary, wrote, I was so mortified and this is a quote, with the apparent insanity of Bonaparte that I stood up and said I wouldn't sign the document. He smiled at me, though, and told me, simply, that it didn't matter if I signed it. My compatriots had already signed it, and they were certain to go to Jefferson with success. That didn't stop Livingston from trying, since he was certain that this plan was all coded talk that meant something entirely different, though Livingston wasn't sure what. Finally, though, Livingston reluctantly gave up and he signed the document. 
unable to convince either and also unwilling to be the guy who didn't let us take over Louisiana, he returned home to Jefferson. Jefferson was the final roadblock. He was not concerned about the cost. He knew that the people would rejoice no matter what. I mean, he was buying Louisiana. How much money, you know, he could shell out whatever he wanted. But he was concerned about the constitutionality of the whole thing. For the executive grants to just up and buy something, without first consulting Congress at least, it would expand the powers of the president to new heights. And when dealing with foreign treaties and powers, it would give him absolute authority. Jefferson truly did slave over his decision, consulting members of his own party and a few close friends like Madison and James Monroe. Finally, though, unable to reconcile himself with the clear benefits of the purchase, he signed the treaty, justifying it with some flimsy excuses about the Constitution. Napoleon was sent the money, and though he didn't know it, Jefferson had made the worst decision of his entire life. It's still debated by historians to this day whether or not Jefferson's choice to buy Louisiana was a good one. Prominent historian and biographer of the excellent Hamilton, a biography about future President Alexander Hamilton, Ron Chernow says that it was a catastrophic decision that the U.S. could have probably avoided. He is skeptical that Napoleon could have found, found enough of a lump sum from any other nation to complete his beacon on Elba in the time he needed to avoid defeat at the hands of, like, everybody in Europe. Rather, Chernow places much of the blame on Jefferson him, himself and his constant attempts to avoid criticism and gain the praise of everybody, which isn't poorly placed. However, award-winning historian Joseph J. Ellis in American Sphinx, which is about Jefferson, puts forward that Jefferson, though a bewildering character, cannot be placed at fault for Winter's Wind and the End War. Napoleon would have, likely he said, found the money elsewhere. And I'm inclined to believe him. It's Napoleon. He'd probably just stolen money from Italy or something. And America gaining the entire Louisiana territory was certainly worth the gamble. Though many historians have questioned if it actually was worth the gamble since the gamble didn't pay off and nearly destroyed Western civilization. Whatever the case, that's alternate history. And this is real history. Jefferson made the choice. The citizens of the United States celebrated the purchase as Napoleon put in the final phase of his plans. Now, if it seemed that I breezed through a lot of important history, it's because I did. We have a lot to cover before we get to 1814, so I feel it's best we just highlight the important sectors. If you want to know more, I recommend Mike Duncan's excellent podcast, Revolutions. If you want more information about the American French revolutions to go along with this podcast, which does an excellent job at telling the story of these two revolutions while also creating a sense of dread at the incoming winter's wind, which he also does very, very well. I also recommend Empire of Liberty by Gordon S. Wood an enchanting history about the early American Republic ending with the election of James Madison to his first of many terms in 1812, and of course, the run-up to the end war. But back to the main event. The world went on normally for a year then, with Napoleon crowning himself emperor in 1804 as he fought and defended the people of Europe, with Jefferson concerned about re-election, but fairly certain that his reputation, it is Jefferson, could get him back in. By this point, under enormous pressure, he had finally repealed the Embargo Act, and American trade had resumed somewhat normally. This had probably garnered him enough love to win, and, of course, anyone could beat a Federalist. As the election approached, only a very strange event could stop the soon-to-be second-term president. And then a strange event occurred. On September 7th, Napoleon got a report from Elba that it was ready. He was to watch from a mile out on his boat, where he knew he would be safe. Oh, did I also say that everyone on the island would die when this was completed? Yeah, they will. On September 12th, 1803, watching from the Aquile, one mile off... Oh, and sorry about the names. I'm going to butcher all of these uh, French names, so forgive me. He called up the sailors and captain to watch it with him, offering ale he brought along to the men while he drank wine. As they watched, a storm suddenly gathered over where Elba uh, once existed... As the storm gathered, it began to spew lightning onto the island, and soon the sailors started asking Napoleon questions, who sat there quietly. He would later write that he was ecstatic as his plans were realized. Then, at around 3 a.m., as most historians have guessed based on the times across the world that Winter's Wind occurred, a massive explosion rocked the island and blew a chunk out of it, and then eventually the whole island. From the island, a huge band of bluish-green light shot out and quickly stretched across the sky. It circled the world in mere milliseconds. It then hung in the sky, giving many places a bluish hue. 
the Zhong King, the Zhong Qing Emperor. Once again, sorry about the names of Qin China. Watched the band course over Beijing, and he commented to a nearby advisor as the sun was blotted out. The heavens are enraged. Nobody in South America saw anything at all, actually. Literally. It was mostly night for a little bit, which probably added to the massive riots that would just burn down Bogota, Lima, Caracas, and Rio de Janeiro. In the United States, the band actually went right over D.C., covering the capital of the U.S. in a strange, unearthly light that fought against the moon. People awoke from sleep and watched, including Jefferson, who said nothing during the entire event, later writing in his diary, God has abandoned us. For 10 minutes, the light hung over the world before slowly disappearing and returning to Elba. Napoleon saw that the entirety of the Napoleonic Brigade was gone. Those who weren't blown into the next universe had been transformed into stone and sank to the bottom of the Italian Sea. He then heard shouts from the boat. One of the sailors started to show off his new magical powers, leading him to being shot in the face by the captain. Napoleon... Looking over the dead man, reportedly smiled and said, The war is over, sailors. We have won. Winter's Wind. That's the name that us Americans have for it. It has different names across the world. In South America, it is known as El Inferno. France and England, it has a twin name, as called by later historians. England knows it as Napoleon's Curse, while France knows it as Cada Napoleon, Napoleon's Gift. In Russia, it was simply known as Rok, or doom. In much of Africa, it would eventually come to be known as just the storm or the new storm. In China, it was Chontang Xinu, Heaven's Wrath. America's name, Winter's Wind, comes from the fact that winter had come slightly early in September, and many people who fled from a variety of places were instead met with the cold embrace of winter, especially New England. Over the course of 30 minutes, at 9 p.m. at night in the U.S., it is estimated that 500,000 Americans in a nation of only 5 million developed magical abilities. The immediate response from the people of the United States was, as one might expect, complete panic. Over the course of 10 days in September, cleverly known as the 10-day riots, thanks historians, every single mid-sized U.S. town or bigger immediately fell into massive riots. New York City found nearly a quarter of it burned to the ground, with refugees from the city spreading out all over the state. Richmond and Charleston were the sites of huge, somewhat pitched battles against local militias and rioters fighting each other in the streets of their cities. Strangely enough, or perhaps expectedly, the Louisiana Territory, which was populated by Native Americans and French fur trappers, was spared most of the violence and chaos. Even New Orleans, with a population of roughly 11,000 at the time, was mostly okay, only a few reports of violence coming from the city. It's where a lot of people would eventually find themselves, running away from the eventual and catastrophic destruction of the South. And far more catastrophic to the U.S. and the South were the massive slave riots that erupted and would continue almost perpetually until 1812. The most famous one was led by Richard Allen, the preacher and former slave who founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was a leader in the free and enslaved black community, so when slaves began shooting fire out of their fingertips, he picked up his Bible and left Philadelphia, writing in his diary that, quote, this so-called bastion of liberty is burning around us, end quote. Big words. Richard Allen arrived in Mississippi Territory sometime in early October, where he set up one of the first maroon communities. Similar to the ones that popped up in Haiti during the revolt and during slavery, these communities were so prevalent in the Mississippi Territory that people began to refer to the territory by its eventual state name, New Africa. Richard Allen pretty quickly appeared in one of these maroon communities, which was named Allen after him. It would eventually become the capital of New Africa. Back in the South, blacks had two choices when they escaped, usually after killing or injuring their plantation owner or a bunch of drivers. First, they could go west to the maroon communities and live out their lives, or they could try to keep up the rebellion. As one might guess, there were at least three confirmed slave armies wandering the south, two in Georgia and one in Kentucky. One of these, the most successful one of the three, was led by a slave-turned-patriot-turned-black mage, Peter Salem. He served for nearly five years in the American Revolution. Salem became a, became a nature mage during Winter's Wind. Salem then traveled south and began to organize slaves together. 
telling everyone that he was sent from God to defeat the devil that is black slavery. Peter Salem, who would come to be known as Black Moses, would eventually command 100,000 slaves, and yes, you heard me right, he commanded one out of every eight slaves by the end of 1812, who would flood into the South during the summer before retreating to the Maroon communities and waiting there in the winter, defending them from marauding bands of white Southerners and U.S. soldiers. But at this moment, he had about 1,000 slaves under his command in South Carolina, burning dozens of plantations to the ground and then covering them in vines and Venus flytraps. And yes, Venus flytraps, it was a bit of a nightmare. It is this that results in a massive scale of destruction in the South. By the end of 1804, fires had engulfed hundreds of plantations and upwards of 10,000 people had been killed, most of them being slaves, but around 30% of them being whites, most of that 30% being poor white farmers. In the South, this was known as the Troubles. Several national and regional figures were victims of these slave revolts. Henry Lee III's wife, who was dragged out of an Arlington plantation by a slave with no magic powers, just a gun and a rope. Most famous of all was Martha Park Custis Washington, related to George Washington, who was found shot and killed in a field just outside of Mount Vernon. It is there that a few soldiers trapped... They watched over the chaos. However, they noted that roaming bands of slaves generally avoided Mount Vernon, either out of fear of reprisal or out of respect for Washington. Probably a combination of both. Jefferson's home was not so lucky. The president's wife's escape, but led by Sally Hemings, who was supposedly a rape victim of Jefferson, and who had gained metal abilities, slaves burned Monticello to the ground. Hemings actually became a lieutenant in Allen's army later, leading a contingent of black slave shock mages, uh, that is, mages who played the role of shock infantry. They were not lightning mages. If I say shock mages, I mean mages playing the role of shock infantry from this point onward. Good? Good. In the north, by the end of 1804, several cities were composed of broken buildings and smoldering ruins. As said, New York was particularly hard hit. It was here that John Jay, who was in the city for business, was found by a mob and beaten to death. He was a founding father. The damage was still lighter in the north than in the south, but it wasn't good. Baltimore city government was briefly overthrown before a group of militia from Salem fought through the city, using a small corps of mages who helped them push through the rioters, who had lynched every mage they could find. The Salem mission was actually led by Qual Walter Walker, sorry, a slave who won freedom based off the state's constitution in the 1780s. He had no powers, but he had no interest in going south, so... He decided to, I guess, retake Baltimore. Famously, Abigail Adams became a mage and was nearly lynched by a mob in Braintree before she shot one with a lightning bolt and scared them off. John Adams was so demoralized by this that he cast his wife out of his home. She would wander back, where she would eventually grow disillusioned in her original hometown. John Adams, broken by grief, died of a stroke ten days later. His last words written in his diary, Honey, come home. So, we've established that the U.S. has become a single raging inferno, including the capital, which was barely defended by an assortment of citizens and soldiers. Jefferson, paralyzed by the entire event, did nothing. He cited constitutional rights and ideals, but privately, Madison thought that Jefferson was so horrified by the news of what was happening, especially to his home and his wife, that he simply stopped caring. It also horrified Jefferson when James Monroe, who was his close friend, developed the ability to use fire and light. Quite rare, though no one knew that at the time. Monroe and Jefferson never spoke again. Though Madison kept up regularly, and their bond, Madison and Monroe's, grew tighter than ever. Eventually, as the riots petered out on their own in the North and in Washington, D.C., Madison sent a messenger out to Henry Dearborn, the Secretary of War. The Madison arrived to a frantic Dearborn, who had been rushing around, trying to contact the Army for two weeks. The 10-day riots, which are generally thought to have ended around September 27th to September 30th, and yes, I know, that's more than 10 days, but the 10-day riots refer mostly to the intense rioting that happened in the first 10 days. They were not ended, however, by military arms. They were just ended by apathy on the part of the rioters. However, he was trying to mobilize the U.S. forces so that they could, oh, mm, I don't know, fight the now mass amounts of slaves literally just wandering the South and getting in huge battles with Southern militiamen. Oh, and the governor of Virginia? Well, he had called up 10,000 Virginians, including those men and women who have magical prowess. That's a quote. Men and women. 
Yeah, Dearborn wasn't exactly thrilled when the 2,000 women who all just joined up with the Virginia militia, you know, did that. Who would be so brave as to just throw off, like, centuries of thought? Governor James Monroe of Virginia. That's who. Monroe, after his run-in with Jefferson and his failure to protect Monticello, promptly buckled down. He put down the slaves of Virginia with unprecedented efficiency, even after losing his home of Highland and his plantation. Monroe also began to, as his advisors and close friends would later say, lose his mind, at least according to the standards of the 19th century. The Virginia, con con the Virginia conscription was so despised by state legislatures that they tried to cancel it in early 1805, saying that it violated the Constitution by drafting women to the army. We'll see what James Monroe does eventually with that, but his actions will eventually inspire James Madison to take his ideals and new ideas and run with them, much to the dismay of his tutor and closest friend Thomas Jefferson. For now, though, Monroe has assembled a 10,000 man and woman army to restore order to Virginia. In New York, the governor's office was empty. That's because the governor was John Jay, who was now a bleeding corpse on the streets of New York City, so, uh, g good job, New York. Stephen Van Rennesselaar, I think, now the governor of New York, was so overwhelmed by the task set up on him that he suffered a mental breakdown and tried to arrest two sitting members of the New York legislature and three on the New York Supreme Court. He was immediately thrown out of office by the legislature, who chose to simply pick a new governor for a short time, which definitely is not going to see New York State devolve into an authoritarian democracy or anything. They picked their man, the one they trusted most, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton, who had suffered public destruction after the Reynolds Affair became public in 1797, was relegated to the political fringes after he used up his remaining clout to help get Jefferson elected. It has been speculated that at some point in July, Hamilton was supposed to duel Aaron Burr, who was furious over Hamilton's uh, endorsement of his super rival, though these reports are not seen as legitimate by many historians. Whatever the case, Hamilton was twiddling his thumbs when, with his wife in New York when, desperate for someone they thought could do the job they needed, New York came calling for the financial wizard and unfaithful husband. Jumping at the opportunity and hoping to put the death of his son who died in a duel behind him, Hamilton accepted and became the governor of New York State on January 1st, 1805. In the South, things had gotten considerably worse by 1806 in Georgia. In the capital, Louisville, Governor David Emanuel immediately resigned and took a boat to Cuba, where he lived out the rest of his life. After chaos, John Millage became the governor and immediately set to work creating the worst state in the Union. He convinced the State Assembly to give him emergency powers, which he then used to dissolve the State Assembly and rewrite the Constitution. He actually had public support to do this after he defeated one of those roaming slave armies, though. By 1806, he was the lifetime dictator of Georgia. Or, uh, he would be the dictator until 1813. He used his power to make the lives of African Americans so terrifying and awful that they would never think of themselves as people. He killed every Native American he could find, and at one point thought about trying to overthrow the government of Tennessee. The people were so afraid of the Georgia squads, roaming bands of mages in the serving of millage, that nobody tried to do anything to stop him. And the federal government didn't have enough time to stop him themselves. And while we're here, let's see what the Native Americans did. Oh, that's right, they rose up in the Western Territories, mostly in Indiana and Louisiana, as you can guess. In what would eventually become Wisconsin, Ojibwe Native Americans would form a massive front and move all the way to the border of Ohio, fighting for their freedom, where they would meet up with a young mage and energetic racist, William Henry Harrison. Harrison, the governor of the Indiana Territory, who had retreated to the border of Ohio because, uh, you know, gigantic... Uh, enraged Native American army coming after him. He would begin the Ohio War because, you know, none of it happened in Ohio, so great naming again. William Henry Harrison would wage a campaign of total destruction against the natives, employing a corps of mages similar to Georgia, all of them water mages, who would drown entire villages of Native Americans. But now, to the main event. In November 1804, with nothing to go off, 12,000 Americans voted in the presidential election. Just 12,000. Which also saw quite a bit of the House and Senate up for grabs. Jefferson was up against his original opponent, Charles C. Pickney. Pickney destroyed Jefferson, who most Americans thought had done nothing. And they were right. Dejected, 
Jefferson went to live in whatever he could rebuild at home, never re-entering politics again. He doesn't leave this story totally, but he won't be back for quite a bit. Pickney was unprepared, to say the least. As he was vice president, and the ent- as was his vice president, excuse me, and the entire Federalist Party and uh, the whole government. He was sworn in in 1805. He was met with an immediate crisis on top of the uh, every single other crisis. At this point, no one knew what soul death was. For younger listeners, and if you are a younger listener and scared easily, I would uh, look away, or I suppose cover your ears. Soul death is when a mage uses too much of their willpower and obliterates their own soul. Or uses a magic that they weren't born with the ability to use, like a fire mage using light or a water mage using lightning. Those who suffer soul death grow large, elfish ears and long fingers and fingernails, along with long feet. Their eyes roll into the back of their head and they can no longer close their mouth. By the way, all that happens in about ten minutes, so this is like something you see in real time. They then roam the world, their souls gone, trying to eat other people's souls. These people are called Reavers in the United States. By March of 1805, when Pickney was sworn in, there were fairly sizable packs wandering throughout the country. Although, it wasn't like in Dawn of Reavers, which is like some weird temporary apocalypse as the movie shuts forward. They were often dealt with quickly. But Pickney needed to do something on the national level to stop it. So he did do something. It just didn't make any sense. He sent four scholars to study one, like it was like a body, and found and find out what was wrong, which even in the early days made no sense. Most knew it was something supernatural in nature, so a traditional attempt at study was so far beyond stupid that it earned him quite a bit of anger from the United States. However, this next act, this next act was not as much hated. He forgave dead for farmers across the U.S., and he sent Henry Dearborn into temporary exile from the army bringing in Benjamin Talmadge, a former Continental soldier and a representative. He was tasked with reorganizing the U.S. Army and stopping the slave revolts. Though he mostly failed in stopping the slave revolts decisively, he did help to make the South manageable so that the nation could begin to rebuild. Uh, sort of. Only nationally threatened in all of the southern states by Allen's army. Oh, uh, yeah. And the other gigantic slave army wandering around. Once again, it was manageable. Uh, it just wasn't perfect. Interestingly, Talmadge also refused to go into the Mississippi Territory to, you know, stop the maroon communities. Instead of recommending it, that it just be admitted as a state for the blacks to which they may go and be free. We can stop dealing with the slaves, for there will be no slaves. A quote of his. Though his state argument was ignored, Pickney allowed him to continue with his ignoring of the territory. Talmadge also whipped the army back into state as, uh, they had become a bit undisciplined since 1804. Magic had completely destroyed the army, but he reshuffled the officers and he got permission to administer conscription, which aimed to get poor white southerners to join the army, but instead attracted poor white westerners, which would contribute to the army becoming a bastion of abolition by 1810, save for William Henry Harrison. However, we will leave off with one last crisis that began to brew in the U.S. Women, who now saw that they could demand their rights from men since they could, once again, shoot things out of their hands, formed leagues of women's rights across the nation. Most importantly, the new Daughters of Liberty was formed by Abigail Adams in Massachusetts. She was now radicalized by her husband's actions, death, and the failure of Jefferson and, later, Pickney. She began to train those who joined, who she called her disciples, in the martial arts. She did this by hiring the veteran Deborah Sampson Garnet, who was joined by her husband and children. Sampson began to preach, along with the Adams, that Pickney and the government did not truly respect women, Incredible, and violence was already beginning between counter groups and the women by summer. Pickney thought it was all so absurd that he wanted to simply shoot them. But VP Rufus King luckily talked him out of it. We will finish this episode, the first one, and hopefully the worst of the whole new series, on the international stage, because this is where the world took a turn for war. In 1804, he would muster 5,000 mages, 2,000 of whom would die of soul death, so that's gotta be terrifying, and then he would plug those mages into his Grand Armée, and promptly steamroll the nations who had been troubling him for so long. By 1805, he had gotten Austria and the Holy Roman Empire to capitulate, destroying the HRE in the process, as well as Prussia to stay out of the wars in the future at the threat of being destroyed by the invincible Napoleon and his army, especially the core of mages that became known as Napoleon's Fist. 
He then turned and began his greatest accomplishment. Napoleon, it is assumed now, must have known what was going to happen, because he managed to get control over his country, people, and army in no time flat, and then he just turned them toward his enemies. In the United Kingdom, King George III, commonly known among the English as King George the Mad, finally and truly lost his mind. During the chaos which gripped the counter-revolutionary British with no warning, as they could not see the band nor a color change in the sky, they were horrified to discover their king's madness. However, feeling, fearing that it could cause more panic to just declare a prince regency while everybody became a mage, George was allowed to retain control. It was with his influence and blessing that Parliament passed the God Bills, which illegalized sorcery, magics, and people of magic descent, under penalty of death, something that even under Hamilton, the United States never did or even tried to do. Britain was losing hold on its massive empire, when they gained intelligence that the French and Spanish were massing their fleets near Plymouth, England, in the Channel. England massed its fleet and sent it under the command of someone who doesn't matter. They were going to send Admiral Horatio Nelson, but Nelson's insistence that he be allowed to use mages to counter the French Navy, which would certainly have mages, was denied. So he resigned from the Navy, and he retired to his home. It would be to the detriment and destruction of England. The English Navy was smashed by the combined navy of France and Spain, who utilized mages as long-range fire shooters, an idea hatched by Admiral Pierre Villeneuve. Sorry, again. The entire English fleet was gone in the Battle of the Channel, destroyed, and panic set in in the British Isles. They were right to panic. On January 22nd, 1806, the entire Grand Armée landed at Plymouth. They then marched from Plymouth to London, scorching the earth as they went. Napoleon himself commanded the army, walking across the burning English countryside, sending millions of refugees fleeing north and most tragically east, where they would simply meet up with the ocean and were trapped between the bullet and the sea. Napoleon, his hatred of the British knowing no end, did not want to be strategic when he defeated them. He wanted to be total. He wanted to make the English go away forever. Mages often joined his side as the army plowed through England, destroying any English army that came into contact with the French Grand Armée. England's land forces collapsed, and under Lord Minnow, Scotland declared independence to save itself the same fate. As Scotland would later find out, Napoleon never planned to invade the Scots or the Irish. Napoleon wanted to scorch the earth that England sat on, making it so barren and horrible that no civilization could ever be started there again. He broke his army into two parts, one that would go up to Northumbria and one that would continue east. They were both headed by around 400 fire mages, who essentially became human flamethrowers that set fire to all in their path. By February 10th, massive firestorms had engulfed England and nearly 4 million English had managed to board the mass of boats that were now engaging in the English diaspora. The royal family collapsed. George III was left for dead by much of the family. It was at this point that Prime Minister William Pitt and Admiral Horatio Nelson appeared at Windsor Castle. Nelson, who was in London visiting friends, joined Pitt at the castle sometime around February 14th, the French mere days away from London. Hundreds of thousands of refugees were streaming onto the Thames River, as fires engulfed the city from the panic. Pitt and Nelson begged the royal family to not take their preferred route, which was up through England and into Scotland. It would almost certainly hit the French army somewhere. Instead, Pitt and Nelson spent hours, even days perhaps, trying to convince them that they should join them on a ship headed for Canada. But none of them listened. However, as they left, dejected that the royal family was marching towards certain doom, one man had a sudden change of heart. The son of the king, George Augustus Frederick, was planning to go with his father, who he chose to not abandon as things looked darkest. However, he was certain that the entire concept of running towards Scotland, not even Ireland, was deeply stupid. Though he thought Nelson and Pitt would die as well, he handed his young, eight-year-old daughter, and theoretically the probable future queen in any expected scenario, Charlotte Augusta, to them. Charlotte was completely baffled as to what was happening. As Pitt took the girl, she cried out for her father. She never re so though she never recalled being fond of the man, Charlotte would later say, quote, I remember my heart shattering as he boarded a cart, dressed as a commoner, heading for Edinburgh. I don't know what the poor sod thought was going to happen. End quote. Pitt and Nelson 
One day before Napoleon entered the city, boarded the HMS Victory, accompanied by 12 ships with soldiers and supplies. On the ship, Nelson would be flabbergasted to discover that Charlotte, who was despondent as one might guess, had the ability to use a vast selection of magic, magics, which she did so on the ship. Though Nelson kept her from doing that anymore, no need to destroy the ship, he had no idea that the girl he saved was actually one of the four champions. And if you don't know what a champion is, you can look it up because you should. No, I'm kidding, but you really should know that. The champions are four people on Earth who have the ability to use an entire quadrant of the eight humors. Nelson didn't know what any of that was, of course, but he knew she was special, which made him all the more dedicated to getting her to Canada. As their navy pulled away, Napoleon entered London. He walked up to Parliament, nodded solemnly, said nothing. His grand army then burned the city to the ground, his fire mages torching every building, every stone, every skull. They celebrated on the ashes of the world and knew that they had done good. Napoleon was also delighted when he heard that a French patrol managed to find the entire royal family trying to sneak away. Catching them, Napoleon dragged them back to France. They would be tried for crimes against the revolution. Stripped of their titles, they were exiled to Russia where they would live in poverty until King George III and his son, now just George, died of an outbreak of typhoid fever in St. Petersburg. The royal family was provided for by the Russians, but the Russians had no plans on going to war when they were trying to get their own house in order, no matter how much the royal family begged for them to get their titles back. They were no longer royal. None of them would ever go home again, most of them dead or dying or having left for other parts of Europe by 1820. Napoleon had achieved his greatest victory, and inside of it, his greatest failure. Over the course of 1805 and 1806, the puppet states of the Kingdom of Scotland King by Lord Minnow, who was employing thousands of earth and metal mages from across Ireland and Scotland to stop the blaze from hitting Scotland. Uh, Ireland was taken and added to the Bonaparte family collection, with his brother Joseph being made King of Ireland and Man in 1806. And by the end of 1806, only a few southern cities used by the French as ports for their navy in the Channel were left in the whole of England and Wales. All told, only two million people were alive in the country when the scorch ended. It was seen as a barbaric act of total evil by all of Europe and America. Of the 8 million people that lived in England, 4 million of them had fled for other lands, mostly the U.S. and Canada, though even the Canadian English would find themselves running south for America when Quebec was established by Napoleon, taking most of Canada. Britain was destroyed. All that was left was a small flotilla that landed in Newfoundland. There, they found out that Napoleon had no idea that they had gotten away. He was so ecstatic with his victory that he just didn't bother to look for them. But Nelson and Pitt, with Queen Charlotte Augusta, knew that they couldn't stay. Already the French Canadians were taking control and many had pledged to Napoleon. So they elected to undertake a daring escape to the far west and north. In the now legendary long sail, Pitt, Augusta, and Nelson boarded their ships and sailed into the far north of the Hudson Bay, landing at a small place called Nahuat. Nahuat was an Inuit village until the British shot everyone there and took over the village. Great job. Raising the Union Jack on a small metal pole they brought just so that they could do that. Thoroughly traumatized, Charlotte Augusta was on August 12, 1806, crowned Queen of the English. She was officially titled at that moment Queen of the Free British. It was also at that point that Nelson, <clears throat> excuse me, who would become a father figure to her, declared that they would train her to become the greatest fighter and English woman on the planet. He recognized that her ability to use so many abilities itself was unique. As the 10,000 or so English refugees sat up, William Pitt was elected the first Prime Minister of Free Britain, among a parliament of 20 surviving MPs who joined the voyage to North America. And on August 14th, Nelson became regent and an Anglican, and an Anglican priest, who would go on to deliver the news of their predicament to the American government, who would later support the British, gave young Augusta her royal name. She was from... That moment onward, Queen Serpusta, a play on the Latin word for survivor. And that is the world after magic was unleashed. Chaos reigns, Napoleon gains victory, but he's not done yet. The world hangs in the balance and America prepares to enter its darkest moments under the soon-to-be and universally hated President Alexander Hamilton.
If you enjoyed today's episode, you can head on over to Twitter. Follow me at the Endcast. Yep, the End Warcast. The End Warcast. Okay, I think you've got it. There are no ads. I don't have a Patreon. Uh, if you don't know anything about the war, DM me, and we can both make fun of you, including you can make fun of yourself, because why would you not know anything about this war? Have a good day. I don't have ads.